Great. So we're about to launch into panel three, which is the final panel for uh, this afternoon. Um, and the focus of this panel is on operations and governance. And I, I believe you heard earlier from Ed um, in his some of his introductory comments about the fact that, you know, obviously this is, and, and we've heard repeatedly over the course of today how really critical um, these elements are. Um, the devil's going to be in the details. Uh, it's a fairly monumental undertaking. And we are sort of at the outset of, I'm wondering if maybe those conversations could move outside. <laughs> that would be great. Thank you. Um, <laughs> the, 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 um, we, we, there's been a lot of thought already that's um, been going into um, the governance structure, the operations, which are highly complex for something like this, as you can imagine. Um, we are fortunate to have a, a diverse group here. We lost one additional um, panel member who at the last minute, uh, from the FDA, who at the last minute had to um, pull out this afternoon, which is unfortunate, but we, we are able to supplement her experience with platforms with Scott's experience with other platforms. Um, so he's a perfect ringer. Um, and I'm gonna actually start by just having, you know, you know Jane, me, but I'm gonna ask the other panelists to introduce themselves and then we can uh, launch into the discussion. Thank you, my name is Carla Kramer and I am the mother of a son, Lucas, who is 14 and has Duchenne. Russ Butterfield, I'm a pediatric neurologist at the University of Utah, taking care of patients with muscular dystrophy. Hi everyone, I'm Marianne Chase. I'm the Director of Research Operations at the um, ALS, the Healy ALS Center at Mass General. Um, a little bit different than most people in the room, I actually don't have any experience with Duchenne's, but we're running a platform trial in ALS, and so that's where I'm here to talk about today. And Scott Berry, a biostatistician at Berry Consultants, and involved in the operations and leadership in a number of platform trials in differing uh, diseases. Great, thank you. Um, so maybe to launch into things, um, Marianne, it might, might be nice to start with you. I mean, we, we had um, these great preliminary discussions with this group, and we learned a ton from Marianne. Um, it might be helpful for you to give the audience a sense of where you guys stand, what you're doing, you know, how, what you've learned in discussions with the other platforms that are ongoing, et cetera. Sure, I'm happy, I'm happy to start with that, and please Great. feel free to interrupt with questions as well. Um, so I can say that we actually have learned a lot from, from everyone in this room. So um, we in ALS, we're very fortunate. We have a, um, a donor um, who sadly was diagnosed with ALS, but because of that, decided he really wanted to change the landscape of how clinical trials are done in, in the field. Um, so we took that donation and tried to find out, you know, what are the ways we can accelerate drug discovery in, in ALS. Um, we were fortunate enough to connect with several people that are doing platform trials, and we went to a DIA meeting last year. Actually, Scott had recommended to us to go to this DIA meeting, and Abby was giving a presentation there as well, and Janet Woodcock. Um, and that's really where we started learning about platform trials. So that was last fall, last November, I want to say. So we really learned about the, the power of the platform trial, which I think Scott had, had spoken about from a statistical standpoint. Um, and we really learned that what you need to do is engage all the stakeholders as well. Um, so what we did was we took that back to our group. We, we're kind of a unique group in that we already have a patient, uh, sorry, a, a, um, a community of, of sites. We've been doing clinical trials in ALS since the mid-90s with a group of sites in the, um, in the US. We um, started with just five or six sites. It was called the Northeast ALS Consortium because they were all in the Northeast. It's now expanded to about 127 sites, primarily in the US, but also some ex-US sites. So again, you know, it's a clinical trial community that, that conducts clinical trials. We manage the clinical trials at Mass General, so we act as an academic CRO. Um, so we have that experience to, to lean on. So from an operational standpoint, we were a little bit of a step ahead. Um, what we really wanted to do is figure out how to conduct a, how, how to design a study um, where we could test multiple drugs, as, as everyone has, has talked about here, um, and, 
and part of that was getting all the different groups on board, right? So we went to the patient community and said, what would you think about this? How would you view something like a platform trial where you would come in and you wouldn't know which drug you might be getting, um, but the chances of you being on placebo was, was much lower. The, we have had overwhelming um, feedback from patients that they are so much on board with this. We've had patients that have written into our webinars that have said, this is the best news I've had since I got the diagnosis of ALS. Because I don't know what's best for me, my physician doesn't know what's best for me, there are all these drug companies out there that are all trying to put clinical trials together. If you guys put them all in one, and there's truly equipoise, and I think that Billy Dunn talked about this and others, really equipoise, no one knows what the best drug is, and you guys are really gonna look for the best drug, I wanna be part of that. So we have, we actually have sort of these research ambassadors, and these are patients with ALS, and also patients, um, family members, and caregivers that we train on an annual basis and to, to learn about why we do clinical trials and what the, the impact of placebo is. Um, and so these are the people that are you know, coming to us and saying, we're gonna support this, we're gonna you know, help, help drive this change. We also want our voices heard. We want to be there as part of the planning of the clinical trial, as is happening here. Um, so we went to the patient community. We went to our individual clinical sites and our investigators and said, this is what we want to do. Here's how you can play a part and you know, who wants to participate. We have 127 sites. I think about, about 100 of those are in the US. We had 75 who actually applied to be part of our clinical trial. At this point, we've selected sites. We selected 54 sites to start the study. Um, and our goal is to start the study early next year. Um, we also went to industry partners, right? So we went to the pharmaceutical industry and put out a request for proposals and said, who would be willing to give their drug and participate with us in this venture? And we got up to about 30 applications. And some of these companies we didn't even know were in the ALS field because they really weren't in the ALS field. They, were, they had a drug that was being tested in another neurologic condition. Um, and they said, hmm, if you guys are willing to do this and put the trial together and operationalize it, we'll give you our drug to do the testing. Um, we've chosen, we have a therapy selection committee that's chosen a small number of those for us to get started with. Um, so we're excited to get that started soon. We have, uh, we also went to the FDA, so we had a type C meeting with Billy Dunn and his associates at the FDA to find out, are we on the right track? Are we planning this the right way? Um, they were in incredibly helpful to us. We were planning our next um, pre-IND meeting with them, hopefully soon. Um, and with that, we're gonna be bringing three different industry partners to that meeting because the industry partners all wanna be a part of this. Um, uh, let's see, who did I miss on my patients? <laughs> uh, sites, industry partners, you know, the community at large, um, really just making sure that everyone is on board with this. So that's kind of where we're at. Our, our goals, again, you know, we're working very closely with the statisticians at, at Barry Consultants to help us plan this. Um, we, have, we have ambitious goals of being able to start this study um, in the first quarter of next year. Um, and I think we're sort of well on our way to that. So before we launch into the governance part, yeah. and the operations part, I'm just wondering whether or not your donor wants to adopt the Duchesne community, <laughs> <laughs> because that clearly was such a tremendous like jump start. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I, you know, I think, I, I think, you know, it's it's interesting hearing hearing everything that I've heard today as well, because again, I'm new to this to this area. I'm not I'm not a physician, and I'm not in the Duchenne's world, and I'm not in a pediatric disorder, which I think is really a very different psyche for everyone in this room than a, an adult's disease. Um, I think this donor. So in ALS, you know, we started studies as I said in the mid '90s. The funding for ALS research was minimal at best. There was the ALS Association that had a little bit of money, but a lot of our funding really came from, you know, NIH grants or Department of Defense grants, really small things, and we were just looking at repurposing drugs. There weren't really new drugs on the market that people were interested in, in developing in ALS at that time. Um, you know, I always say one of the huge changes that came, and I'm sure everyone in this room knows about it, is the Ice Bucket Challenge, right? Pete Frady's and the Ice Bucket Challenge. It not only raised money for, for the, the foundations, like the ALS Association, it raised awareness. People, all of a sudden, everyone knew what ALS was, and everybody knew that it struck people at the prime of their lives. 95% of ALS is sporadic, so you don't know if the person next to you is gonna get it, and you know, it, it, there's really, no way to, to know who's gonna get it next. And I think that puts an urgency on everyone to think about, wow, 
I could know someone with ALS, therefore I want to fund this research. So people were giving $5, $10, you know. I think that raised huge awareness. Um, and then, you know, we were fortunate, you know, sadly, again, this person who, who has ALS, um, you know, really saw there were a lot of impacts by the funding that had already come into the field. Um, but he's a very astute businessman, and he thought, from a business perspective, you need to hit this at many, many angles. And he's been advising us all along as to how to do this, and he is 100% on board with the platform trial is the way to get a drug developed in this disease faster than doing one-off drug development. Thanks. So um, one of the key and probably the, and, and the first of the oversight committees that um, we are conceptualizing for the Duchenne platform is the steering committee. Um, and right now what we're envisioning is predominantly clinician scientists and uh, patient parent representation on it. Um, that among other activities, they'll oversee um, review of um, applicants um, for participation, you know, different uh, companies that come in to um, uh, use the platform trial. Um, I'm wondering how, whether or not that's similar to, you know, what, what are your sort of overarching oversight committees look like um, b before launching into things like DMCs and things like that, right. but yeah. Yeah, so I think from, from our perspective, you know, um, there's a lot of, in a six -month of basic science research in ALS. So while we have a steering committee, really an executive committee meeting uh, or executive committee group, um, there's also a therapy evaluation committee. And those are the people that really look at the science behind the drugs and really making sure that there's going to be equipoise if there are multiple drugs tested in the study. So we really are, are relying on the scientists. And they then give their recommendations to the steering committee. And they base those recommendations on you know, the, the science of it. And then the, the executive committee has to look at all the other factors, some of the operational factors and other factors that would, would impact. So if I may follow up with a question to Carla based on that, that so the idea at the moment is the steering committee would be primarily cl clinicians with some patient family representation. Is that a, um, a, a composition that would make you comfortable about going into a platform trial, that the best possible interventions are there that you, your child was get a, getting a, a selection or a possibility of a, a, a reasonable intervention. Would that add to your confidence, or is there a different composition that would make you more confident? I would say it. I have confidence in that because you've got the, the experts, the clinicians, and then you do have family involved. I think you do need that perspective. Um, how heavily weighted? I don't know that it needs to be super heavily weighted, but at least a few voices there. Um, again, because the experts, like, I don't know much as a parent, right? I'm not, I'm not into the metadata, and I'm not science-y and like that. So, um, yeah, but I think that's a good composition. Maybe we'll ask Scott about the composition of such steering committees for other platform trials as well. Yeah, I think it's very similar to that, and most of these platform trials are run by a nonprofit or a patient organization. There's one in pancreatic cancer, for example, that's run by PanCan, a patient organization, and they've got a very similar structure to this. A sporadic Alzheimer's trial in Europe is a very similar structure where there's a drug selection committee, there's an overall steering committee, and then each arm also has a steering committee. There's a separate PI mm -hmm. for the arm um, within that, so there may be an overall PI and then an, a PI for an arm, and then an arm that steers that particular arm through the trial. Mm -hmm. I love the idea that there's, there's patient representation on all of those committees. Yeah. So I've got to throw in the rhetorical question, where does industry fit into the steering committee, Scott? The, the industry actually chairs the steering committee for their arm. And for example, we heard earlier, we want to make sure the trial is going right, the CRO is getting the data and all that. So they chair that, but then there's representation on that, and then they report to the overall trial steering committee that doesn't have a, a drug sponsor on it. They're the sponsor of the trial, but they don't have individual ones because this is the larger global setup of that. And Mary Ann, do you want to comment on your relationship with the industry and your trial so far? Yeah, so as I said, we got an overwhelming response um, of industry partners that were really interested in this. Um, we've chosen the, the first three or so to get started with. Um, you know, to, 
So far, I mean, I think so. My background is that I was in industry for a few years in regulatory affairs, and and my first worry when we started talking about this was, would industry trust us to do that? We're an academic group. We're going to run the study. How does that work? Um, you know, so what we did to prepare is we sort of did our own internal audits from a, from a, an operations standpoint to make sure that we would we would be able to answer all of the questions that our industry partners would would ask. Um, and and to be honest, we have been working really well with our industry partners. They've asked all the questions we expect them to ask about quality, about monitoring, about making sure that the study is going well, and that you're going to end up with good data at the end. Um, and I think that's everyone's goal. Um, so 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 far, we've actually had great interactions. And and Russ, as the <laughs> academic representative at the table, what are your thoughts on on that type of a composition? I, I like the idea of a. Uh, sort of an overriding steering committee that's not have farmer representation, but obviously that different arms need to have that. I think and I, I wrote down a whole bunch of questions we've been talking today, and one of those questions is is what who sets the agenda, and how do we set goals for the community that aren't necessarily pharma driven? Because one one way of organizing is that. We, we organize a platform trial. Pharma contributes studies to the trials. We approve or don't approve the drugs, and that's sort of where that ends. But more broadly, you could conceive of a trial that answers lots of other questions about patient care, or about natural history, or about a lot of other things. And I think um, having a committee that sets that agenda is really important. Yeah, I mean, because I think there's a lot to be gained. I, there's there's a lot more to be gained than just approval or non-approval of a of a specific drug. Absolutely. I mean, you could also envision um, as part of the, you know, in the beginning when we're just trying to figure out how are we going to give life to this entity, you know, it, it feels a little bit um, more like needing to invite players to the table as opposed to setting the agenda. But I think that's such an important point. And I think that this is such a interesting opportunity to be able to um, drive that agenda through other funding mechanisms, you know, through comparative effectiveness trials. I mean, right. there's so many, like, invaluable, right. um, you know. And I think those agendas align with pharma to some extent. Oh, absolutely. In, in some places, yeah. they don't quite. So if the community can set that agenda. Well, I think that's probably where the steering committee becomes very important in setting that agenda, because it shouldn't be me saying what, what, what this community should be doing. It shouldn't be Deborah. It shouldn't be any one of us. It needs to be all of us, as I said in my opening comments. This is something about the community, and that's why I think the composition of the steering committee who's going to help us set that agenda, prioritize interventions, is going to be so terribly important. Mm -hmm. um, but I, and, that, uh, but, and that's why we led off with the question about the composition, because if this is the group that's going to be setting the agenda and deciding where we as a community should be going, we need representation from all the appropriate groups. So I think that's a really important point for us. Of course, funding comes into that question. Right. It, it, it's, it's the balance of those two to investigate the questions that have the funding tied right. to that. That's my next question. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How does the funding structure look like, and how much of that is independent of pharma versus uh, pharma? I, I think there's a great benefit to pharma to, to establishing the infrastructure, so how much of that pharma money can help establish that and to answer the broader questions, how we can capitalize on those things. Yeah. No, that totally makes sense. And um, from the standpoint, and this is a little bit of, you know, n nuts and bolts. Um, apologies to, to, um, well, um, this is just nuts and bolts. But uh, Marianne, in terms of the other um, uh, oversight committees, things like uh, data monitoring committees, adjudication committees, um, those sorts of, uh, I'm assuming that you're using centralized, a single centralized. Uh, entity for each of those sorts of oh, yes. activities? Yes, we are. Okay. We, we would have central committees. Okay. Um, are there things that you're doing from the committee oversight perspective that we haven't talked about at this point? I don't think so. I okay. think from an oversight perspective, I think that's... Yeah, it's what, it's what, what haven't we thought of yet. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
you want to move to yeah. that? So one of the things that we, th we think will be an advantage in this platform is the fact that we can use common clinical trial sites, databases, clinical trial management, and all the other infrastructure. So this goes back to what Scott was saying at the beginning of not rebuilding the stadium each time, but using the same stadium for multiple interventions. Um, of course, one of the challenges of that is the fact that if the data is going into a common database, Individual sponsors don't necessarily want to share their drug arm data in the first instance. We hope they will long term. As Billy Dunn said earlier, I am the data guru. I believe in sharing data, but I do, we do understand that individual companies aren't going to want to share their intervention data early on. But that shared infrastructure, whether it's, whether it's the clinical trial sites that are up and running, whether it's the shared common database, the common case report forms, these, this will provide quite a lot of simplicity for the sites moving forwards. And Russ, do you want to comment up from the trialist perspective? I, I guess just, I think the benefit is obvious and we spend so much of our time just with recreating the wheel for every study, right? Every new CRF, every new, and, and it goes pretty deep. The more studies, the more regulatory stuff. So the, the better centralized, the more common things we can do together. And that, that comes from even just the, the different type of outcomes we're measuring and the standard operating procedures around those to handling specimens to everything about it. Um, the more centralized, the faster we can move through our regulatory um, people and IRBs and other things. Um, and it takes time, you know, from our coordination staff and others to, to handle those things. If they're different for every trial, it just, it just it's mind numbing, right? <laughs> Quick standard, a standard contract. Age. A but standard you can contract. Just append. Can you right, imagine? Right. It's all those things will really help us move faster. Yeah. Right. It just it just speeds things up. Right. I, I don't think there's any question of that. My other question sort of comes to the same thing, which is, is going to be for Scott. This was my question that was for Laura Lee Johnson from, from the FDA, but unfortunately she couldn't. <laughs> I, I can speak for the FDA. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you can, Scott. <laughs> uh, but you're, but you're in this room. <laughs> yes. <laughs> unfortunately, what I am going to ask you to speak about is the value of data standards, CDISC standards, and standardized databases, which as a statistician you should be happy about. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, so I can't speak to the, the CDISC aspect of this, but the standardization of this for the FDA, there, it's many of the things that Lisa Lavange talked about as the huge advantage of this. The quality of the data, the standard of data. When a new arm data comes to the FDA and the, the previous data they have, the same endpoints, the comparability of those uh, will be huge for them. So something that becomes interesting in this is that, and I'll give you an example, the Diane 2 TU trial is dominantly inherited Alzheimer's. This is early onset, onset Alzheimer's, mutation positive patients. They're current, they enrolled uh, in a Lilly drug and a Roche drug simultaneously, each with placebos, and it reads out in, the, in February. And it's not only the shared placebos that they have, but it's the other arm. Imagine the advantage of the FDA looking and seeing, okay, this is what placebo did. Here's what the other arm did. Or in ice by two, there are 15 of these. So the inference goes up much more even than control from the FDA perspective. But the standardization, the data sets, all of that, they're going to get better data, higher quality data, which is partly why they're here saying do this. Now, we'll add that we do still have some FDA people in the room. If they'd like to comment, feel free, but don't feel obliged to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I think we've actually done a lot of. We've, we've sort of covered that, haven't we? Exactly. Totally. Um, it's been such a. There's been so much conversation today that that much of what we anticipated talking about we've already talked about. Um, so um, I guess we. You know, we've covered this a little bit too. But um, Carla, since we have you up here. <laughs> um, just from the community perspective, you know, per perception of, of the trial, um, what are your thoughts or concerns about, you know, w and we've circled back to this in 47 different ways, but it's helpful just to hear mm -hmm. everybody's perspective, as many perspectives as we can. But what are your thoughts about um, uh, the lack of control over um, which intervention arm um, y you're son or a participant may, may have. You know, my husband and I talked about this because I was reading this 
to him and we were discussing it and I don't really have concerns. I mean, I think this is a really good thing because this is, it's disruptive innovation. It's getting drugs faster. It's getting results faster. It's these, these really, I mean, they're clinical trials. So sometimes as a family, we think of it as therapy. It could be therapy. It's really a trial because we're trying to get data. So it's just getting that data faster. Um, it's more inclusive. There's more boys in it and young men because it's, it's enrolling a larger number. There aren't as many, it just today there's so many limitations. They're so siloed. My son's in a trial, right? And it's, we, by the way, we don't have any data from that either. You know, it's three years in, it's anecdotal, but we don't have any data. So we don't really have concerns about being randomized because they're all potential therapies and eventually uh, you're gonna wash out if you're not seeing, right? So I know there's a lot of questions Again, you know, the details of all this, it's gonna be challenging, but um, I work for a company that does this. Like they're all about disruptive innovation, helping clients change and adapt so they can survive, you know, in the economy. So this is like changing and adapting so our boys can survive. This is huge. I mean, I'm really excited. And everything I've heard today and hearing you talk, Marianne, as well, um, it just makes me more excited. And yes, I know it's a huge challenge, but isn't it fantastic that we have all these brilliant people at the table that are gonna solve this challenge? So as a parent, I am super hopeful. And I'll say one more thing. Our son just, he turned 14 in April. And I, as I was thinking about this, the platform trials, because I've really just learned about them very recently. Abby's been kind of helping me out to understand a lot. Um, but he's 14 and you know he may be at 50% complete for his life, right? I mean, if I'm lucky, right, 28. So this is real, folks. And so faster, yes. Mic drop. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Carla, for those very meaningful comments. I know there are lots of other people with other perspectives in the room, so I think we'll open up to the room for other comments and other perspectives, because um, I want to hear from all of you. Jane, I have a quick question regarding operations. So um, I guess we all know from the sponsor's perspective that it's a lengthy process to do feasibility and site selection. So, Who's going to be responsible for selecting the right sites, meaning the right staff? Uh, we all know that we all tend to go to the same sites for very obvious reasons, but how do we make sure that not every site is going to have Linda Kripe to do cardiac MRI and Hank Meyer to do FVC and so on? How do we make sure that they have enough space for even drug supply? I've had this issue before where a site would not enroll more than five patients because they don't have you know, enough space to put the drug with A, B, C, D, E, F, G, you know, appendices, how are we gonna make sure and how much are the sponsors gonna be involved in, in the selection process, especially with all the extra assessments that are intervention specific? Thank you. So as another person who ran an academic research organization, um, I, I, and, and then was in industry, um, I share your pain. And, um, and I know it from both sides of the table. Oh, oh yes, it's very real. Um, I w would say that at this, at this point in time, the way I conceptualize this is that site selection um, will be, and, and feasibility will be the responsibility, within the responsibility of the centralized entity that is the Duchenne platform trial uh, thing. thing. <laughs> Um, ex yeah, exactly. Um, but I do think in terms of, of defining exactly what does feasibility look like, what are the, the site selection criteria, you know, that is something that should be finalized with, um, you know, the, 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 the policies and procedures should be finalized with the um, uh, industry representatives. Um, because obviously that's something that all of you have, I mean, it's critical. Such a, such a tremendous stake in. So I think that there needs to be a comfort level within industry, um, but it, it, it will end up being in the responsibility and then the ongoing quality oversight 
will, will, will be the responsibility of the Duchenne platform trial entity. Right. One, I think one benefit of the shared infrastructure is that um, you can ensure that the participating mm -hmm. sites are meeting a certain level of excellence at their sites and that they have a certain capacity. I think from my standpoint as the site, um, our biggest problem right now is just our own bandwidth. Mm -hmm. Like I, I have to be pretty selective about <coughs> trials that I do because I just don't have the capacity. So if, if we have a big platform trial with A, B, C, I might be okay. D, E, F, like I might start to just drown a little more. Um, right. So that's a that's a big issue for us, I think, would be just how do I keep up with adding. The shared infrastructure helps that, right? Because it takes, it compresses a lot of the day-to-day -day work. That, and it give, and it enhances my bandwidth. But I, I mean, you saw the slide at the first of the day. There's more trials than I can possibly do. Right, right. And, and what I think we'll all need to learn is how much does that shared infrastructure um, impact your bandwidth? Um, because, you know, I think we can all imagine, gee, that'll be so much more efficient and therefore better, but how much better, just in terms of time management, and, right. and that right. remains... Because conceivably it could be worse, right? If every well, trial has a lot of oversight, A, B, C, and D, each are coming in with different monitors, different things, we could just completely suffocate in that. Yeah, no, no, we're aiming for efficiencies, yes. better, <laughs> better. So if I can just add to that, too, and just say that, so in the ALS world, as I said, we have our, our, our group of sites, so we know this a little bit, but I think our sites are having those same exact questions. How much bandwidth, how much staff do I need to have on, on site? How much does my central, does my local pharmacy need to have in terms of space? I mean, these are real questions, so whatever learning we have, we'll certainly pass on to you guys. Um, but I think that we're, we're, we're dealing with that same question, and I think that's a real question, and I think it's also why having a site member as part of your governance is another piece. Can, can the That's sites manage point, yeah. taking on yet another drug, or do you have to wait until one comes out before you add another one? And, and you know, I know this is my fantasy of your um, glut of, of funding, which is a <laughs> fan fantasy, but um, do, you, do you provide, I mean, you know, for instance, some NIH, NIH networks, you've, um, there is direct funding to the site for you know, their coordinator, data management, what, what, what have you, so that it really has dedicated time for those various trials. Are you able to provide that for your sites? Unfortunately not, only because there's 54 sites, so to provide a yeah. full-time coordinator would take another really, really large donation. I think that not would not even a chunk. To yeah, I mean, I think that what we're trying to do is make it so that the per, the, the, what they're paid on a per-subject basis is substantial enough livable. so that they would be able to hire but i think you're right i mean the, you know so we we're the coordinating center for the neuronex network and we provide a you know we nih provides a full-time coordinator which makes our lives possible because those are the critical people as the coordinators and making sure they're that they are paid for yeah, yeah. i think yeah, I think, you know, my, uh, my comment or question sort of feeds into that. Maybe it's more time to dump more cold water on people, I don't know, to, to see if we can solve, <laughs> solve that problem. But, um, but, you know, I think within the Duchenne community, we have a tremendous opportunity as a result of Parent Project's efforts to put together the um, CDCCs or the, the, the um, network of uh, clinical centers who have come together to become certified um, that can provide a real stable source of uh, and a cohesive uh, groundwork to um, run these clinical trials in or to implement the platform trials. So I think, you know, there's a lot of um, organic energy um, in place to, ch to, and to, to catalyze a really important um, reaction here. And, and I think that um, to put these CDCC centers together has been has taken an enormous effort and several years actually it was harder than anybody even sort of imagined imagined but now many of the people and investigators from these sites are here and very engaged and interested in 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 moving to the next step so i think in, in it sort of mirrors the als network in, in that mm -hmm. regard that's great so jane i will take you up on that um, opportunity to chime in um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Michelle Campbell, and I am from the FDA. Um, and I work very closely with Laura Lee Johnson, so I'm going to try to channel my inner Laura Lee with something <laughs> on data standards and make her proud. Um, so first of all, you need to start thinking early about standardization and how you're going to do that. Don't wait till the end when you've come up with that CRF form, and then you've got to make sure it works across your entire mm -hmm. platform. 
So really think about data standardization early in your, in your programming, in that protocol development of what is this going to look like. Um, one of the nice parts with CPATH being a part of this is they do work with CDISC as well as the FDA working with CDISC. So you're going to be getting some natural standardization occurring through this platform, but there are ongoing things that change over time, and so you always want to make sure you're updating to what the current standard is. Um, we were just looking and checking in that the FDA has a new study data conformance technical guide that was just updated in March. So we're even continuing to update our information. Um, so think about it early. Um, don't wait till the end because one of the biggest things that we want to be able to do is to be able to interpret all this data that's going to be collected. And if we don't think about data standardization early, it will make it a little bit harder and so we can't get to that end faster or understand those decision points. So think about it early and so that those would be my words um, that I think Lurley would try to convey to you is that it's important to think about data standardization not as an afterthought but as a critical need in your study design. Thank you. I think we have time for maybe two more comments. Okay, and then there's one at the front. Uh, Susan Ward, CTAP. Um, I wanted to come back to the, uh, the governance uh, question, if that's okay. Um, you know, today is a lot, um, a lot of today is about stakeholder engagement, uh, learning, etc. And earlier today you had, uh, up until this panel, you've had somebody from the industry represented every time. Um, Russ, I thought your comments were extremely well taken as to why you would not want the industry to dominate the agenda. And I think everybody would understand if, that you wouldn't want to have somebody from the industry from a specific drug company in, in that kind of position. Um, but they have been included as stakeholders today. So I, I guess I have a question, which is um, the drug companies you've clearly been working with a lot. Um, that's very evident. Um, how useful have they been? Oh, enormously useful. And I think really in terms of in terms of creating something like this platform trial there are two groups of stakeholders well three there are three major groups of stakeholders without the buy in and without the input we cannot do this one is obviously the patients and families because if nobody wants to put a patient into this trial it's a flop number two is the clinicians because if none of them want to be a site for the trial it's a flop and the third is clearly industry because if you don't want to put a dr drug into the trial it's a flop. So, so absolutely all of those groups are absolutely essential to this effort. That's why we're having a stakeholder meeting now. It won't be the last. It's, we've had focus groups with every sector up until now. I mentioned at the beginning, this is a community effort. We need everybody involved because it's something we can do together. But if we do a part, we absolutely can't. So I guess that's my point. Um, with regard to the overall executive steering committee, um, and I, I was a bit tongue-in-cheek if they've been useful, because I imagined that they have. <laughs> um, but I would make the same point. I think once you're up and running, that doesn't mean they're not going to be useful yeah. again. So I think you need some mechanism by which you ensure that once you're rolling, you, you've got that continuous uh, dialogue. Yeah. And I know it's not easy, but I would right. just encourage that you not kind of you know, exclude un and unwittingly. It's a, it's a fine balance because obviously, and I, and I love the suggestion, Scott, that, that um, I can't remember which of the other platforms is doing where, you know, the, the arm specific steering committee is chaired by the sponsor. The um, sponsor then like reports into the overarching steering committee. Um, I think, you know, that's a really nice construct, uh, the thing you need to be careful about is the steering committee is going to also be talking about things that not every sponsor wants discussed with another sponsor, their enrollment timelines, etc. So, so you do need to have the entity where there's going to be freedom to be able to discuss what would otherwise be, you know, confidential information that they don't want shared with any other member. But, but I think your point is really well taken. It is, they are an essential component of, of you know, the, the key stakeholders. I guess I would simply say it's perfectly feasible to have three competitive conversations. 
Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. B busy doing them. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, there was one in the front and one in the back. Okay, good. Hi, uh, Terry Ellsworth from Pittsburgh, mother of Billy, 18 and three quarters with Duchenne. So a uh, couple of questions, comments. Um, the platform inclusion criteria, I think there's still some vagueness, but I've uh, been trying to ask this question from this morning, but Dr. Clemens uh, touched on it as well. The ambulant and non-ambulant, thank you for that, by the way, age greater than five years old, but it doesn't mention, is this infinity and beyond? So there is no age out. Exactly, no exactly. age out. There, okay. there may be a function out at the end of the exactly. right. But okay. it's not, but nothing, no, no anatomical age. Okay, so that needed clarified. Um, regarding the six minute walk test and the 100 meter, um, my question is really how different is that? And Joanne mentioned standardization across the sites and I can testify firsthand to that too, with my son being in trials. Um, any problems that, you know, with inconsistencies across the sites can also happen with the 100 meter, I would think. Um, and my question on the 100 meter is, how, how is that being conducted? Is it, um, 100 meters is a little more than a football field. So is that the, the patient will walk, what are you timing? And how are you timing that? And this isn't for screening, is it? Because no. they're no, going no, 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 no. It's okay. just it's just a an and then assessment. And assessment. functional. Where's Tina? Craig could talk more specifically, but Tina it's the Tina. same twenty-five meter course. Yeah. Yeah. It's the while well, well, you're bringing it, it's the same twenty-five meter course we would use for the six-minute walk test. So you need it about okay. a thirty-meter-long hallway. Yeah, so there, there's really nice uh, SOPs and standardization for that protocol. It's it's using the same the same course as Russ mentioned that the six minute walk test uses. So essentially it's four laps to the 25 meter course. Uh, but, but again, they try to do, do it as uh, fast as they can. So it's, it is a capacity uh, measure. Yeah, so I don't see personally, just from a parent's point of view, a huge difference between that, the six minute walk test, and that goes back to that controversy. So that's just my two cents. Um, the other question is, or the other comment, is uh, I would caution strongly the four stair climb. That's our son's nemesis. Enough said about that. Um, I would personally never use that as an endpoint. And then my last question, uh, the imaging DMD study data, 10 years plus of data, is that being considered as an endpoint at all? There's some good data in that study. Yeah, so that, that's probably the one. The six minute walk distance and concluding MRI imaging are the two things we've probably spent the most time discussing because I think that in some ways with, with the imaging we're at a point of equipoise where there's a lot of data to support MRI fat fraction, but there's not all, enough data to say it's a validated endpoint. Um, we're still working on putting that together. Added to that, it's expensive and not every site can do it. So if, where we are now is uh, thinking, thinking that this should not be a core endpoint, but for specific interventions where it's appropriate, it could be added as an additional one. As data is added, and we've, uh, um, I've certainly been in a lot of discussions with Imaging DMD recently about trying to pull some data together to see if we can get it closer, to, closer towards get validation. At that point, we might consider adding it, but for right now, not every site can do it, and it's expensive and time consuming, so we decided not to have it as a core endpoint. And the sites may overlap. It's just not every site. The, um, the imaging DMD network isn't isn't enough sites enough. in itself. Yeah. yeah. So real quick, Terry, I just wanted to clarify on the hundred meter. Hi, it's Tina. Um, the hundred meter, that um, like Russ and Craig were saying, logistically it's the same course, but operationally is different. So it was it was made with the intent of having younger kids do it because if you think of attention span, the attention span's not six minutes, right? But you're asking directions are entirely different. With the six minute, you can't run, and it's explicitly stated that you can't run. But the hundred meter, the intent is to run maximally uh, for the four laps and so that's the the primary difference and so the hundred meter that's been developed at nationwide they've had a really nice correlation with a lot of time function tests including the six minute walk tests and so really it's not about the time it takes but it's about the the attention span and that's the 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 origin of its um, of its development 
Okay, and, and with that, I, I know that there are more questions and comments, which is great. That's the whole purpose of today. But we'll have further opportunities to, to continue them. So I think we'll, we'll pause now. We will have a break maybe for 10 minutes. Uh, so we'll stay on track. And at 3 o'clock, we'll meet back here for the parent perspective section. Which will be lots of opportunities to ask more questions. Exactly. <laughs> thank you all. And thank, thank you to our panelists.